Good morning, everyone. This is the third Sunday of Advent, and it is Sunday, December 13. Uh, we're coming to you from Ansley United Church in Markdale, but a warm welcome to all of you, uh, wherever you are, near and far, and uh, it's wonderful to have you join us on these uh, Sunday worships. So uh, one announcement before we begin, and this is primarily for our Markdale audience, but I do have uh, a, a sample of the luminary that I'm asking each of you to make. And uh, it, the packets have been available in the office. And if you hadn't picked one up yet, this is the time to do it because I need this returned by Thursday the 17th. So it's just by Thursday of this week that I need that returned because uh, we're going to use them in our Christmas Eve uh, worship service. So uh, if you can do that and help us out with uh, one of those luminaries, uh, that would be wonderful. So we're going to begin our Advent 3 worship with our prelude. Thank you, David. Our first hymn on this uh, Advent 3 uh, Sunday when we celebrate Mary is number 46 in Voices United, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. call to worship. We gather today on this third Sunday of Advent to celebrate Mary, the mother of Christ, 
and to remember the waters of birth and blessing. Let us be blessed by the spirit of living water who holds all creation in its womb and who helps us to awaken to a new birth at the most opportune time. Let us be blessed by the spirit of the tides whose rising and falling ground us in the reality of our days. Let us be blessed by the spirit of the dew who drops down and rises up with virginal water and invites us to drink deep of the waters of life. Let us be blessed by the spirit of Mary, the birth giver and God bearer, who represents the union of male and female energies, a divine symbiosis, and who offers us a call to bring a hidden divinity to birth in our lives. May it be so. Well, it's the third Sunday of Advent, and uh, so before we begin with our candle, we'll light the first two. And if you are following along at home with your own candles, then uh, by all means, uh, light the first two as well. Today, we remember the gift of the story of Mary, mother of Jesus, and known to some as the mother of God. We do not fully understand the mystery of her presence in the story, but in a time of great darkness and oppression, herself a poor peasant girl, betrothed to a lowly carpenter and facing a lifetime of hard work and a hard scrabble existence, she had great faith that the spirit of the living God could and would visit the earth and bring new life to bear. She represents this for us, that all is not lost, that the world has not completely gone to hell in a handbasket. She represents an opening, an awakening, an awakening of consciousness. She was the first in a long line of women and men who would come after her. She represents one who allows herself to flow with the stream of life who does not resist the waters of birth and new life, and who allows herself to be a vessel for all that is good and blessed and true. In her story, as fear and anxiety, rage and humiliation, all those shadow qualities are acknowledged, we witness the loosening of their hold on Mary and the release of her power, the power of desire and the power of joy. We can imagine her dancing in circles of ecstasy and joy as she loosens the grip of darkness over her and stretches herself forward toward the light of the future. So now we'll light the third candle, which is the candle of joy. And hear these words of Mary. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. 
So we'll conclude our Advent candle lighting with the hymn 16, Mary, Woman of the Promise. Hymn number 16 in Voices United, Mary, Woman of the Promise. Now it's time for a prayer. Let's bow our heads. Oh God, as we light the candles of Advent, their light seems fragile, even weak, and mirror our own fears and anxious hearts. We wonder, can we muster enough courage and love for the healing of the earth around us? Yet we remember the light of the world does, does still live within us, and the birth of the Christ still takes place in our hearts and minds, not just at Christmas, but all the year through. We light small candles, but the light we carry in us is the most powerful light of hope and truth. It is cosmic in scope. So in this light, let us bring our fears and our sorrows. Let us hold this light for others in their fear and their sorrow. Let us pray for the sick, for those facing COVID illness or those fearing it. Let us remember those who have died from it, now millions around the world. Let us pray for those we love, those in our circle of friendship, those in our church who are going through tough times. Let us pray for those for whom Christmas is often hard. And let us remember those for whom this Christmas is the first one without someone they love. Let us pray for the healing of our world, the earth itself, its energies sometimes thwarted by humanity's other plans. Let us pray for an end to violence and hatred and for justice for those oppressed. And let us pray for those outside our normal circles and let us find the grace we need 
to broaden our circles. And in these weeks of December, O oh God, visit us and help us find comfort and joy in our lives, in our hearts, in our spirits, we pray. And now let us pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now our script, scripture reading for today is from God, the Gospel of Luke. It's chapter 1, verses 26 to 44. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a young woman pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The young woman's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For it is that no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And here ends our scripture reading. Our hymn is number 74 in Voices United, What Child Is This? Number 74. Sleep. 
Well, what a pleasure to be here with you today. Back in the day, I had the opportunity to attend a three-day seminar with Walter Wink, along with 30 or 40 of my colleagues at the Toronto School of Theology. Now, Walter Wink was a Methodist minister in the United States who taught at the Uni Union School of Theology. And he was really famous in the States because he had taken really uh, early stands against homophobia and other justice issues. And he had penned many great books and had achieved perhaps what in theological circles we would call rock star status. And I was going to spend three days soaking him up. What a treat it would be. Now, the first morning of the seminar, we were introduced to his wife, June. June was a lovely woman, an activist like Walter, and a professional dancer by trade. She wanted us to move our bodies. Before getting into the words, she said, we had to get into our bodies to loosen them up and open them up and prepare them like fresh clay rather than old, hard, fired clay to dance like the spirit was moving in us. So she put on some loud music and before you knew it, there were the 30 of us moving around the room, trying to avoid eye contact. One particular friend of mine, Stephen, stood to the side of the room. He was frozen in place and the look on his face was one of abject terror. This was not what he or we had expected from a seminar called Engaging the Powers. But June was relentless. She was well accustomed to managing the fears of uptight religious clerics like us, so especially we of the WASP traditions in particular. And most of us, our only movement in church, just like you, is to just look down and surreptitiously check our watches, that kind of thing. June made sure that before every session with Walter, we spent 20 to 30 minutes waltzing around the room, loosening up our bodies. The idea that we might bear some theology in our bodies, not just in our heads, was kind of unnerving and threatening to most of us. Yet for some, it was really freeing and liber liberating one fellow that I knew really well, uh, and I never would have imagined this, he went leaping around the room. Another friend, uh, Carol, her name was, uh, shouted and exclaimed these odd cries that just emanated from her. And later she said she didn't even know where they came from. Patriarchy has had such a firm grip on our religion and most religions, what with its hatred of the body, its near fanatical need to cover up the body from head to toe, and its smackdown of anything remotely sexual, that the, co the concept of our bodies being anything but mere matter kind of frightens us. It's just not part of our worldview. And patriarchy has taught us well to hate the body, but to love the soul. And by God, keep the two things separate. We beat the heck out of that old doctrine of original sin, which is essentially about the sin of our bodies, right? The sin that our bodies do. And as you know, we've blamed women for that. And so that's another reason for us to hate women's bodies more. And it seems to me that in our world today, there's really no room left for this kind of outdated patriarchal thinking. Andrew Harvey, in his book, Return of the Mother, in fact, he says every single religion, not just ours, has completely failed the women of the world. And together, the religions have so subjugated and denied the concept of the divine feminine with the focus on transcendence, which is to get out of your body, right? The t transcendent spirit is to get that out of the body and mixed that in with the obsessive covering of the female body, which you very well know still happens today. 
that the end result extends as far as the earth, that we continue to desecrate the earth and all of nature with wanton disregard, having no idea why it is we feel so disconnected from the world in which we live, it's mother nature. We act as if we hate. The two things are intertwined. The fear of the feminine is a very powerful male energetic force that is repressive and oppressive. And this male energetic force has had its way with religions for just a little too long. It manifests itself in a fear of change. So for instance, if we suddenly started to use the word goddess for God, and went through a whole service of worship only using the word goddess for God, well, you can imagine the outcry. Don't try it. When we hold forth against change and we stand, as it were, with our walls against the, uh, the wall of a dam, lest it should break, we are actually exerting power against the natural forces of nature. I've heard that in Hawaii, the god of Kilauea, Pele, is a female god. And she creates new life, and in particular, new land. You can actually go to Hawaii and walk on the new land created by the god of the Hawaiian volcanoes. Her feminine power is so attractive to Hawaiians that when Kilauea is uh, erupting, they flock to the island. They don't flee the island, they flock. They wanna go and see it and witness this uh, divine feminine power. Put this way, my little tiny experience of dancing around a classroom with a bunch of my colleagues pales by comparison. And yet that experience grounded me in something really deep and important, even if I'm still just kind of learning what that was and maybe still don't quite get it, um, trying to understand the power of the sacred feminine whose power lives in human flesh and blood and the desire of whom is to bring to bear a new child in our world, in our time. And that new child in our time will bring the gifts we all want, peace and harmony and goodwill toward all people. Like we're still wishing for the things that our ancestors wished for. So on this third Sunday of Advent, it's really important for us to look at Mary and not turn away from her because we're confused by her or don't understand her. To look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, the queen of heaven, the holy Voss, whatever name we have for her. Because it's important for us to take some time to, to think about the divine feminine, the sacred power of the holy vessel from which all life emerges. So the first thing to say and to admit right up front is how as Protestants we tend to be so ambivalent about Mary, the mother of Jesus. We actually, I think in our tradition, have judged her very harshly, especially the fanatical worship of her in some places in the world. We claim that he, she is just a woman neglecting to hear our own sexism in that term. Yet we want to accept that she's virginal and pure so that when she does give birth to Jesus, she gives birth to the child of God. You know, in other words, uh, we Protestants will never say so out loud, but we kind of want it both ways. But consider this. Mary would have been 12 or 13 when an arranged marriage was made for her to the carpenter Joseph. 12 or 13. Girls in poor societies were often considered a burden. They needed to be married off, sometimes for a dowry, if the family was lucky. In that time, girls were nothing if not married to a man. They had no status 
They had no right to own property of any kind. And in a court of law, they would never be able to be a witness because their uh, voice could not be trusted. So this young woman, 12 or 13, gets pregnant. Let's not argue how. Let's think how terrifying that would be. Who will have her now, you see? Joseph could divorce her quietly. The Bible even says this. She is damaged goods. Such a terrible patriarchal phrase to use of a woman. And if he did let her go, then she would be homeless, stateless, and incredibly poor. No power, no rights, nothing at all without a man's protection. And let's remember that having given birth to Jesus and six other kids, by the way, uh, uh, the gossip and the shame thrown at her, the shunning from even her own family must have been intense at times. And let's not forget that there she was at the cross when Jesus was being crucified, having his body mutilated and leaving him to die like a common criminal. She witnessed the whole thing. So Mary is a strong character. It is amazing that the Bible gives so much time and attention to her. Now, she had a lot of power. And that's really incredible for a young woman, 12 or 13, in the time in which she lived. And so what the stories of the New Testament try to do is to show us what she represented. Who was this woman wasn't quite as important as what she represents in the story. And what the, the, many of the things that she represented were the things that the church tried to, to smack down through the centuries, even though uh, they did it by removing her from the human realm and making her the queen of heaven, sort of pure and untouchable, therefore not truly human. Mary's power lies in the fact that she represents and embodies the divine feminine, a person who, however we understand it, accepted the divine reality in her body. Right? She found God in her body and who then trusted this divine reality enough to want to give birth to it. You see how amazing that is as a concept no one had ever done that before. The early church fathers, right, the early patriarchy, wanted to keep her chaste, keep, to keep her removed from the ordinariness of human life. And this does a great disservice to her because her power comes from being ordinary, from being an ordinary human woman who trusted her body to do great things. What Mary does in the story is she reveals to us all the sacred energy that we have in our bodies, whether we're male or female. And she reveals another one of those amazing hidden truths. She reveals that everybody is a vessel for divine power. Everybody, yours too, can give birth to a child that will change the world. And this divine myth is such that we are not so much physical bodies, but that we are divine spirits infused in physical bodies. And I know some of you probably won't like me saying this, and you might disagree with me, but 
this belief that we are not just physical bodies, but we are spirit-infused is the core of the Christian faith. It is what incarnation means. We've lost track of this theology, and it's largely, largely a result of our own complacency and our complicity, too, with the powers of patriarchy. We have so denied and subjugated the divine birth as something that is necessary for us all because what we've done is we've said it was just Mary giving birth to Jesus and we have covered over the truth of this divine reality with so much of the Christmas externals as if in some perverse way we are obsessed with not finding the divine reality at Christmas time and would prefer much not uh, would much prefer not knowing what it is really about let's just have our turkey dinner and our presents don't bother us with divine truths no one needs to hear a message that they might carry within their own bodies a portion of the divine reality that stuff is too abstract in our modern world In one of my congregations, there was a young girl who was nine or 10 who started riding her bicycle every day, sometimes for hours on end. Everyone thought it was awesome that she was training to be an Olympian. But the truth is, she ended up in sick kids hospital with anorexia nervosa. Every time she ate anything at all, she had the urge to ride her bike until she felt that she had ridden off the calories. At nine or 10, she could not accept an ounce of fat on her ugly human body. A friend of ours every December wears a dress every day to bring awareness to the fact of human trafficking of young girls and boys, captured and trapped in a cycle of drug use and sexual exploitation. And this happens every single day in our country. Need I remind you of the evening of December 6th, that we'll never forget the misogynist murdering rampage of 14 young female engineering students at the Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. When the killer claimed he was fighting feminism and separated the men from the women and started shooting. So you see, how we think of bodies matters. A lot. The denial of divine embodiment in our bodies leads to people killing other bodies. So, this is why we can't give Mary a pass. Right, she embodies the divine reality, however we understand it. Don't worry about the concepts. She embodies the divine reality in her. And so we get to that scripture that uh, conveys that message that she gives, that Magnificat scripture that I read when we were lighting the candles. Mary here has such a strong voice. She's the champion for the oppressed. She's the mother of the lowly and the poorest, the servant class, the humble. And she blesses those who will bring down the power corridors of the patriarchy. I still can't believe they left that in the Bible. To dethrone the rich, right? To kick the rich off their thrones is basically what it says. And to proclaim that her power instead is going to be used to feed the hungry of the world. Let's put that in context. If I had the power, the first thing I would do is I would fix the water problems 
on our reserves. This is by far one of the most astonishing pieces of scripture ever written. It alone is enough to portray the powers of the divine feminine when fully let loose in our world. Well, what about our world? So much pain and suffering. Every day we get the death count. It almost seems like we're obsessed with death and suffering. And then we hear about forest fires raging and oceans rising. And we're upset when our government suggests charging us a little bit for the pieces of Mother Earth that we use. We keep polluting and ravaging the Earth because it's just a body to us. So isn't it time for a little bit of Mary's feminine energy to be born into the world? Isn't it time for us to join the dance instead of standing frozen on the sidelines of the dance? Isn't it time to have eyes for new life instead of death? Isn't it time for us to carry some energy into the world? And think about how it is that us, we, even us, might give birth to a new reality. I hope that you'll take some time this week to think about Mary. She has a lot of power in this story. She had the power to transform a whole world. How about you? How about you? Okay, we're going to end our service now, and our hymn is number 59, Joy to the World, number 59. Boy, if you thought that Mary's song was uh, a strong one, these are very strong words uh, in this hymn. Number 59.
Well, let us go from this place as the vessels of divine love, divine joy, divine peace, and divine hope. And let us in our living give birth to these realities so that we might each of us, the ordinary people of the world, change it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll have our postlude. <laughs>